Hey, everybody. It's your pal, Greg Bendian, here at the podcast. And uh, I'm here with one of my musical pals and, and somebody who is one of your musical pals, I'm sure, as well. Mr. Dave Gregory from Big Big Train and, of course, XTC. Hi, Dave. Hello, Greg. Nice to see you again. Always nice to see you. And this is a really nice occasion, I must say. It's, uh, well, we're celebrating nearly 40 years of uh, uh, an album that didn't do very well commercially at the time, but people have grown to love over the years. And it's uh, it's been refreshed by our good friend, Mr. Stephen Wilson, and polished up and presented in a slightly more, um, from maybe a slightly less abrasive manner. Uh, I, I hope it'll appeal to more people. I, I think more people will be tempted to check it out as a result. And uh, I, I personally, have had a reappraisal of it and find it, you know, really, really quite quite an achievement. I think it was a back burner one for me. And and I was waiting for this reissue, this remastering, this re uh, sonification, uh, because I did find the CD transfer that I had pretty off putting. I love the writing, but I wasn't the production wasn't landing for me. And so this is a much more of a three-dimensional listen for me. Sure. I listen to Big, the Big Expressed now in the current package. And I will say this also before I turn you loose, which is this thing is stacked. It's stacked top to bottom, back to front. I have to say it. Every song. It's another one of those XTC albums where you don't skip. How, you know, how yeah. many of those do you have? I just, um, as I say, I just listening to it again after such a long time, because I mean, like a lot of people, it wasn't my favorite XTC album. And I never really revisited it after we mixed it and got it, because it took forever to, you know, whole summer of 84. It was just, it went on and on and on. And uh, I was really, really glad when they finally uh, decided to put it out as, as it was at the time. But even then I grew tired of it very, very quickly. And I didn't really want to have any reason to revisit it at all in the, in the, in the ensuing years. So having come back to it, I can hear there is some real serious quality there, certainly, especially the writing. And I think we probably just took it all a, a little bit for granted there about how prolific Andy was and how brilliant he was, how his brain was working and the, all the, the thoughts in his head and the way he was able to transfer everything into song and, and rhyme and, and poetry if you like poetry yeah. it's really deeply intelligent writing uh from a from a man who was still you know in his early 30s and just just who everyone sort of sees as a kind of reformed punk rocker uh I, I, from from a from a council estate in swindon that is some achievement so i will forever be uh in admiration of Andy and Colin to a degree for, for how they were able to just keep coming up with the songs and and get, getting better with each record. It's remarkable. It really is. And there's so much writing on this. So this was what struck me about if you look at some of the songs that have you know, C section, D section, E section, you know, where, where there's transitional material, there's just writing wall to wall. And so that plus now a, a, a uh, an enjoyable sonic palette. I'm over the moon about this record again. And, and you know, and that I never was uh, before, even though, you know, love, wake up, love, uh, um, rain of blows. But to hear them now where this guitar sounds are right and the keyboard sounds are right and the, and the drum sounds are right. Um, I wanted to ask you if it's okay about, you know, some things about each of the tracks, maybe not all the bonus stuff. And, but, but now that we've both been listening and, and mine finally got here from the UK, um, I'm curious about this notion going into this, that you thought, or there was a certain percentage of, keyboard playing on this record and very little guitar playing for you on this record. Is that true? Yeah, uh, but we uh, certainly in rehearsal, there were quite a lot of guitars in rehearsal. Uh, but when we uh, came to sort of get into the studio and there were 
there were keyboards available. I have to remember in 1984, we didn't have a synthesizer. Actually, we did. We had a profit synthesizer, a little Korg. I can't remember what the, what the co what, what it was. It was just a little monophonic music box thingy that we used to take on the road for it. It wasn't really, it was just single note function, you know, and it had a, had a few bunch of daft sounds in it, but it was useful. We've made use but you of it. use it on, on, on no thugs. Yes. Uh, no, we use the profit on no thugs. We use the um, uh, profit five. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Profit five. That's what we had. That's what we took away. Took, okay. and, sorry, sorry to interrupt. And the also uh, and David Lord had this. Um, he had a couple of synths in in the in Crescent Studios where we were working. One of which was this Roland JX three P, which had a built-in sequencer to it. And this is a sidebar, really. But this is I've told this story a dozen times. This is where I discovered the sequencer. The JX three P has a little. Uh, I don't know. It, well, it was a very very primitive sequencer in it where you could program you know notes and just turn a dial on it and it would play these notes over and over and over again and you could hook it up to MIDI and trigger samples and everything and that's how I got into arranging strings using a sequencer I went you know I thought this is a great idea let's get us let's take this and get a standalone sequencer and hook it up to a decent synthesizer then I can do some strings that's all in that was all in the future in 1984 but that's where I discovered it and I think we were just um you know, Andy, again, listening to uh, the remix, especially the instrumental mixes, I can hear how much of Andy's guitar there is now on, on the record that I wasn't entirely uh, aware of at the time. Uh, he'd written most of the songs on a, on a, on a guitar tuned to the open chord of E. Right. And so that was kind of... is an issue. It affects the writing for this guitar stuff. Very much so. Very much so. I think it's very unlikely that Train Running Low on Soul Coal would come in, have come into existence had he not stumbled on <laughs> quite a accent on that tuning. And uh, I'm not sure what drew him to it. I think I, I seem to remember something about. Uh, yeah. Hmm. No. After you all have to ask him why he decided to tune a, a guitar to the chord of E. It might be just the fact he liked the sound of being able to strum an open chord and not have to bother putting his left hand on the fingerboard. It may have been something as simple as that, but it certainly produced results. Well, can I bring up, of course, uh, Beating of Hearts, which had uh, a tuning scheme there? Did. Well, that was slightly different because we, we had the guitar tuned to, uh, all to, I think it was tuned to the note of E. I mean, we ended up putting a rick and back a 12 string every string tuned to a different octave of e and that was the uh, that's how that shimmering effect was achieved but i think that was the only time we did anything that extreme and um but but yeah uh, i and i also colin uh, i think he had a uh, an upright piano at home and he'd written some stuff uh, some fairly basic piano things that I was able to develop as well. So I think I just got used to sitting behind the keyboard and letting Andy, um, you know, but having having listened again to these mixes, I noticed a lot of the keyboards have vanished. <laughs> Sorry to have to say it. There was some piano at the end of Wake Up. That's gone. There was a lot of piano on, um, on Small Town. That has vanished com completely. Uh, as as is, I can just about make out a couple of my guitars on that track. It's mostly Andy. Um, and similarly, uh, You're the Wish. There th was, yeah, the piano. Actually, the sound, you can hear it more on the instrumental mix. But then the melody uh, was it... missing from the instrumental mix of Seagull. Yeah, <laughs> there certainly is. I just listened to it. And all they've got is the reverb return coming through, uh, and that's it. <laughs> but you know, something I really enjoyed listening to that the mellotron and the vocals out of the way, there's some cool stuff going on. Really and I also stuff, think, yeah. you know, this sounds like a steely damn basic track. You know, they could have been this could have been one of Roger Nichols' jobs, and um, uh, so, so it's always uh, enlightening to hear the, the music in, in, in a different form, you know, in a way you've never heard it before.
I think so that's so <laughs> important. That's so much a point of these things is hearing them the way you didn't hear them before and uh, a kind of articulation, a, a clarity that's achieved through this process. It's not really a mucking about with, but I mean, there. I don't know what the reason would be for omissions that we just mentioned, but it's just such a stack of work of, of, of things here. Um, did you only, well, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I think probably one one of the main criticisms of the original mix is that it was too crammed. Like you say, it was stacked. Uh, and I know Phil Thornally, who mixed, did the original mix, you know, he was tearing his hair out, wondering what to do with all this information, because, you know, everyone wanted to hear everything. It had to be louder than everybody else. And so there was this kind of delicate balancing act that was never quite balanceable, if you, if you like. So he, I know, has always had a little bit of um, a feeling of frustration that we couldn't have been more uh, brutal with it, with the actual weeding process before he got to work. He had so much stuff to, to, to contend with. So it may be that the reason this new release does sound more appealing is the fact that a lot of stuff has either been pulled back in the mix or, or, or buttoned out altogether. <laughs> Most of it's mine. But uh, anyway, there you are. I wasn't there. I wasn't there at the mix. So that's uh, that's fine. But yeah, it doesn't matter. That's the result. It, it, it works now. It works for most of us. I still think there's a couple of songs you probably could have gone back and re-recorded from scratch. I still really? think Small Town could have been done. With, I, I would re-recorded all the guitars on Small Town because they're so thin and, and scratchy. But the song you know, is there, you know, it's emerged. It's not submerged beneath a whole bunch of uh, details. Uh, but I would have liked a, a, a warmer sound on, on all the guitars on that track. And similarly, You're the Wish, I think uh, that probably this <laughs> bloody snare drum is louder than everything else. And uh, that's, that's something that happens a lot when Andy's mixing. So um, those are just my feelings. I'm not really uh, here to to uh, to criticise them because <laughs> everybody would would will tell you how they would mix that album. Oh yeah, everybody's got an opinion on that. Every single person has an idea about how they mix it, and I don't want to fall into that camp. So I'm happy to hear it as it is. It's great. It's it's fine. Much more attractive than it was previously. Well, you know, Dave, you bring up a good point about the snare drum level. And one thing that I noticed in general is if we embrace this idea of the, the concept of the album being man and machine, that the drums would have the, the electronic nature of some of those drums, the concussive nature of some of those drums might be part and parcel of, of the whole game. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's very, I mean, Andy, I... He's always said, you know, I'm a frustrated drummer. He always wanted to be a drummer. I think it was just the fact that uh, his mum was struggling with his, the sound of his guitar. He thought he would stand a chance if he brought a drum kit into the house. He'd be banished for life. So maybe that's what it was. But I, I'm glad that he, uh, he chose guitar and, and, and the songwriting route. You know, obviously that's what his strong points are. But uh, he is always very, very he puts drummers through the mill. I mean, really, Greg, to be honest, or even the most, uh, I'm sure Prairie and Dave Maddox would tell you the same thing, that uh, they really did have to up their game to, just to make sure Andy was happy. I think it wasn't that they played badly. It was just falling into his way of thinking, that's all. Well, Pat Mastelotto tells the story of the difference between a, uh, a grace note, a fraction of a second versus another fraction. And Andy was able to pick out the one that was the one, you know, yes. no, that's the one. And then he goes back and he finds it and he gets it every time, you know, now that's the yeah. one. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think, but, but Pat also was in awe of the fact that, you know, when you're following Terry Chambers, and I think it should be said, that Terry really brought the drum voice alive in XDC. So it's yeah. always going to be a fourth character. It's always going to be another character in the music, isn't it? Yes. Yes, of course. And I think the fact that Terry has been able to 
put a band together and go out and tour under his own name well you know the xtc connotation obviously but playing a, a set of xtc songs and sell tickets and have you know people come away really really impressed with the sound of what they're doing gives you shows you this testament to the fact that you know even after 30 years away from it he's still mad enough to get back on the stool and give it another go and people love him for it i mean like, like people showed up at our shows just to watch terry because he was always um, the man machine you know you just you just you just wound him up and uh, he was there just never wavered for that whole hour and 10 minutes or however long we were on stage he was in control he was the engine and that was uh, basically he was the strongest of all of us physically for one thing <laughs> you know, I think by the time the after an hour we were all flagging, but Terry was still uh, covered in sweat and looking forward to his first beer. You know, sure. But it was he was a big big part of the uh, not just the albums, those early albums, but but the live show as well. And I've been to see the the XTC project that that Terry has now, and I have to say, I second your uh, emotion on that it's it's really uh it's a great sounding band and the the material just holds up live like nobody's business and mm -hmm. of course that's exciting also because again we get this three-dimensional experience of the music where because bands don't play those songs very much so you know how that that gets to be like where you're, it's sort of like a, a special skill set might be required between these yeah. individuals right so you don't have a lot of gentle giant cover bands, you know, you don't have right. so not successfully. So, um, yeah. And then I, so I guess what I'm wondering th then Dave is what did you play guitar on? Notably. I think, I, I, no, I played guitar on every song. Okay. It's just where it sits in the mix. I think the only one I didn't play on was I remember the sun. And, um, okay. Cause I was going to ask, is that Andy on that line? Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I, I always had a problem with that because a thing was that Colin, I think he, uh, he uh, did he ask me to play it on piano, but I said, look, I can hear sort of, I could, I could do an, a piano arrangement on this, if you like. It has and, a very um, nice piano arrangement. Yeah. So I, I worked on that. I, I spent a, a couple of weeks writing stuff out and trying a few things because I, I my keyboard skills were primitive, you know, at best. So I thought, well, I'm going to push myself on this and see how close I can get to um, something. You know, I was listening to a lot of uh, Steenie Dan and Joni Mitchell and people who were using that kind of smooth LA style of piano playing. Uh, I thought maybe we could we could throw a little bit of that at this song, um, and then. <laughs> As I say, I was talking about Train Running Low on Soul Cole and Andy's guitar on that, which I love. I love his playing. His solo is just mental on that song. Really but I didn't think that style of playing fit I Remember the Sun. Still, he came in with this really uh, abrasive, jarring riff. I notice on the, um, on the remix, he's playing a counterpoint to the piano, which is louder than the piano. It's actually almost as loud as a vocal. And it's a mess. But I, you know, we should have had a discussion about that, but that's the only, that's my only reservation about really um, how, you know, the, the, the fight between guitar and piano, that was, that was the one point is the choruses of uh, I Remember the Sun. I don't put people off the song by drawing it to their attention because there's always that risk. But um, that was my, my one reservation with it because I, I worked a long time, uh, long and hard on the, on making sure the piano was, was felt the way I felt Colin was hearing the song. Anyway, we don't know. I don't know what Colin's view is. I never asked him. Well, I do think the yeah. piano carries the day on that one. You don't, you know, it, it could be the most jazz that you guys ever are. Mm. Yeah. It was jazz E. I wouldn't say it was jazz. Jazz, jazz E. e. <laughs> yes. yes. A bit like someone mentioned, they were like, it's like when you see a confection described as chocolate e may not actually contain chocolate. Well, I think it's a beautiful piano part, Dave, nonetheless.
Well, um, thank you, Craig. And You're I can kind. tell That's that that, that and, and Rook must have been real uh, backbreakers. Yeah, Rook was tough. That was very tough. But uh, Andy wrote that. I mean, I, I had nothing to do with it. He, that's all his own work. He did it using a sequencer, I think. Maybe he had his uh, his wooden hand with the chord chains. But when you're playing the tremolo chords <laughs> yes. in the B section. Yeah. That's a lot. I was, um, it, <laughs> I've said this before. I mean, we're on to a different album now, but. I would have I wouldn't have struggled as hard had I not been forced to play it to a click track because he wanted to um, uh, sync in some synthesized strings. So it was important to have everything running, you know, we could run a sequence off the sync track. And so everything had to be uh, done to click. I can, I can still remember. Actually, no, it was no, wasn't that? Yeah, I could just remember the, in the control room at Chipping Norton, Gus Dudgeon lying prostrate on the, the couch at the rear of the control room, you know, just waiting for it to finish. <laughs> it's just like, come on, get it together. Because in rehearsal, you know, we were, it was quite, it was all right. I, I actually found a way I had it written out, of the manuscript written out. I practiced and practiced. I could do it. Till it came to listening to that tick, and then you realise, yeah, yeah, okay, a little bit more work needed here. But anyway, that's a different session altogether. Yeah, but I but back to the idea of you know keyboard and guitar ratio for you on this record. Um, are there any featured guitar moments of you on on this record? Ah. Not really. Uh, well, uh, uh, as solos, no. I mean, the thing was, train running low on soul coal, you'll hear me scrubbing away at that guitar. But was, again, Andy wrote it, but I had to play it. And, um, you know, the, the, the central riff that the song is sort of built around. And then when it goes into the half time section, th uh, there were the, uh, yes, those sort of descending, descending arpeggio things. I'm not sure. Yeah, I have to listen to Andy's demo and uh, see whether he, he'd written those. Really, it was the middle eight section when the 12 string guitar comes in, which is, was in regular tuning. That wasn't in the open tuning. So I had to uh, play the part. I mean, I, I figured out what Andy was doing. It's very easy to play in open tuning in, 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 a, in a chord. Because I, it, it puzzled me how he actually arrived. It's a, it's a brilliant bit of music. It's really a great composition. The way the chords move down and get back to the mother key. It's just genius writing. How did he find that? Well, well of course, when I was in this um, open tuning thing, I could, oh, that's what he's doing. He's just moving. He's going to kept the same shape with his left hand and just moving down a couple of frets. It's reasonably physically undemanding. So, uh, you know, when I, I hooked the 12 string guitar up in regular tuning and kind of did a transposition and added the two, the top four, the top two strings or the, the core, the four strings, the two courses of strings are open. I just left them ringing open while these changes were going down. So you've got that open string thing going on right through the whole thing even when it goes into the uh, when it goes back into double time and and, uh, and finds its way back to the uh, to the riff uh, there was something about the addition of the 12 string guitar brought just raised the energy level up you know uh, another uh, a step a big step so i was very pleased with how that all turned out and i remember time doing a a sort of banjo style thing towards the end of it on the last couple of chord changes which i swear to god i could not do today because I, I used a flat pick i've never learned to play with banjo style i used a flat pick to do all that cross picking how i did it i don't know but i did it you can just about hear it in the mix you see i put all that time in and what happens down with those faders but that was a highlight but doing um I, I, 
as, as noisy and as brash and as of, offensive as it was, train, camp, train running low generally, that was the song I enjoyed working on the most because it was just, you know, well, it was that like, crazy. It's like the travels in Neilon and, and uh, complicated game, you know, the tune that's going to finish up that XTC album. It's going to just blow your doors off. Yeah. And it does. Yeah. yeah. We had a nice also, it's that. funny you mentioned the, the, the key thing, because I was listening to it today, as I've been doing it for the several days, and it just struck me today. I said, what key is this song in? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, no, it's, it's a... <laughs> well, it's all centered, as I say, around an open chord of E major. But... um. The riff, it's a kind of a G thing, isn't it? It's over, over G. I think it's G, actually. I think maybe the mother key is, is, is G, maybe. But we always had these issues. Uh, like the, the song would the be... minor. Or I don't like he's not going to the mother key. Yeah, right, right. He's kind of skirting around it. Very strange. You know, if I had to score it, I wouldn't know what, uh, what the key signature would be. I'd just use all accidentals, I think. Leave it open, just right in the, but uh, thank goodness I would never have to do that. And also struck me as very beef heart. Yeah, certainly the guitars are like beef heart in a very bad mood. And, uh, but I have to, I, it just made me smart because I hadn't heard, you know, the, the, that solo, you know, properly mixed and separated from the riff. The two, you know, you've got my riff going on in the right channel and then this clattering racket of Andy's going, it's just so angry and brutal. And it just made me laugh. I just listened to it and listened to him go, <laughs> what's, what's upset him? Mm. It's just monstrous. And um, yeah, no, it, it just, there's that little phrase he plays in the middle that sort of goes da 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 just nuts nuts yeah and that that's the sort of beef heart uh i think that was the beef heart reference there for something it just sounded like something off trout mask yeah yeah but again the range does strike one that you have all of the XTC colors are there, but they're sort of in a different you due to the, now kind of being, I don't know, is it a very electronic sounding record? Every time you think it is, then you hear something like Liar Bird and you're like, no, this is this is the XTC that I know. Mm. Yeah. Well, we've always been, you know, a variety act. I always like the fact that you never knew what song was coming next or what style it was going to be in. And yet it all kind of, it never felt incompatible, despite those, uh, you know, this is this is the thing, I think they, um, there was nothing, nothing felt out of place on any of our records, despite the fact that they were many and varied in style. Um, yeah, and then I'm listening as well, the one song that I'd completely over, well, kind of overlooked, because it, it probably feels more removed from everything else on the record, is This World Over, which was released as a single. And uh, I, I heard that and I thought, oh, I haven't heard this for such a long time. This sounds really, really nice. Why was, why did, why was this not a hit? I, sh I mean, even if there are still things such as record charts today, we put it out as a single mm. you know i would have thought it would have done very well i mean i was listening to it and i had sh I, I had shivers i thought it was really beautiful especially the part in the middle where suddenly there's a sort of guitar solo i did some if just they said we don't want a solo we just want some effects uh we'll just put them into the uh whatever it was david lord and we just do some stuff with it later do we just want a kind of some atmosphere mm. And that's basically that the solo is just this bit of atmosphere and it goes into this big big chorus that takes the song away you know and um and i thought it all worked really really nice a really nice build and it was a serious message that still is relevant today probably more than ever 
yes it, it does it does stand up and uh, make you feel something if you're really paying attention on that one oh. you know um i was going to ask you uh, well i guess if we talk about that song just for another second it's like there's this thing about um this period of xcc going into certainly into uh oranges and lemons where the ride out the plateau ride out as andy would call it the ride out is about 30 percent of the total song <laughs> i was looking oh. at some of these and just saying like yeah and i guess you and i have talked about these these ride out moments like uh um oh uh, um daisy you know humble, humble daisy, daisy. Yeah. it's another great example of just the ride out being such a big payoff. Yeah. Now, did you think about that? Because that's true on Wake Up. That's that's true of uh, of this world over, you know, where the ride out becomes just this luxury. Books are burning, yeah. Well, I don't know. We just, uh, yeah. It's it's usually the ones with the long ride out end up being, uh, you know, they, they, they kind of finish or close the album. Maybe as a sort of uh, a way of um, leading the listener away from from this particular record and and towards the next one. I don't know. We never. I don't think we ever thought in those terms. It's chalk just the way hills, things, right? Chalk it's hills. like a question of yeah, yeah chalk hills as well. It's a question of what follows this song. What can we put? It's gonna you know having having done this long ride out. What comes next? other than um, silence. So I think that's probably what it was. It was just a question of uh, choosing a suitable song to close the album with that would be difficult to follow. It's um, on the topic of the guitar, uh, the guitar attacks on this record, we also should mention Shake Your Donkey Up because mm -hmm. that's quite a rocker. Are you on uh, guitar in that in that piece? Yeah. Uh, if you listen to the demo, that was done in my front room back when I, in my little house in, in Stania Street in Swindon, when, where Andy would occasionally come down to visit when he was in town shopping. And sometimes he would uh, he'd come in and say, oh, I've got this little idea. You've got, got some tape. And we'd just, uh, just for a couple of hours in the afternoon, muck about with some stuff. The Lindrum must, it, it, I must, it must be one of those rare weeks when I actually had possession of the Lindrum because I can hear that on the demo. So he must have programmed this basic rhythm because if you listen to it, it is just going round in a circle. It doesn't, it's not programmed properly. It's just a four bar loop. It's just constantly going around. And he said, try this guitar riff. So it's his riff. He gave it to me to play. And so that's, uh, we, we just sort of, I, I wasn't aware at the time that he, he had written a song around this riff. Maybe, I'm not sure that he had. He just had the riff, thought, let's hear what this sounds like and see if we can do something with it. So um, that's how it started. And I think he must have come back a couple of days later to add the bass and do the vocals. It was just uh, because it was just two guitars. He had that sort of chorus. You can hear the, the you know, the, the, the donkey riff going on in one channel. And then there's this rather gloopy chorus guitar part that he added at the time. And then he took it away and um, came back a couple of days later and did the bass and vocal. I think that's how it was done. But it was definitely um, a, a demo done on a four track TAC recorder in my living room. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was, I think it must have been one of the first songs written for the album. Was he it? hadn't, as I say, it was just an idea that he had, and uh, he, he developed it later once once he'd got the once once he'd got the idea of the thing on tape, so he could hear it uh, played back. Well, you know, I just I like I, I like that through line of of rock guitar in the band, you know, so that you you have your kind of coming up to the moment of keyboard technology or drum technology and then that's a, a very 80s mid 80s sounding record in some ways but but the writing and the arranging and of course the the vocals and the vocal arranging and the lyrics bring it to this whole other level of quality 
I'm listening to it, uh, Dave, and I'm wondering, did you guys do group vocals? Because some of the backs sound like it's more than just the lead singer multiplied. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there would have been uh, certain vocal sessions. I can't remember, quite honestly, where or when we did those vocals. The thing is, I normally, or I did for a, for a couple of albums, I used to keep notes. I had a little diary about, you know, what we did day by day. And over time, of course, they proved very useful yeah. in settling arguments and, and, uh, and just providing information about how uh, I've got, got it all for Black Sea and English Settlement. I've got a day by day of both of those albums mm -hmm. and also Oranges and Lemons as well. But the others, for some reason, I never, um, uh, you know, I probably was getting a bit complacent and thinking, yeah, well, you know, this is our job now. It's no need to make notes. It's just, we've, we've just got to make these records and blah, blah. So that's didn't consider it important. Wish I had. We did some vocals at Rack, and maybe it was when uh, the album was being mixed. It's quite possible that uh, we, we did some backing vocals there when the album was during the mixing sessions. I may be wrong, but I don't recall. Don't recall any singing. Don't even. I can't even remember hearing Andy and Colin singing. They must have done, obviously, what they did. I'm just. I just can't remember where it was. That's interesting because I on, because I, on this world over, I hear your voice, I hear Colin's voice, you know. So, um, I was just curious about the the backing vocals since they're handled beautifully on on all of the records, you know, co so thought through. But it's interesting to hear that this sounds like they were an afterthought. Yeah, no, it, no, they were <laughs> described as an afterthought. Um, I, I may be mistaken, okay. but uh, I mean, we we would have done the, all the lead vocals would have been done at Crescent with David Lord. Certainly, that was there was no question about that. And I imagine the backing vocals would have been done at the, that time as well. I just have no memory of it. It is nearly forty years, yeah, as I say, it's, and, and I'm not getting any younger. Um, well, um, you know, we're great. Yes, listening to. I was. Uh, I did a, a interview recently with a guitarist who was who was also doing a podcast. He was anxious to know how we came up with certain guitar parts, and he gave me a list of songs to swat up on. And I'm telling you, I struggled with all of them, just from the fact that uh, I'm not as strong or as sharp focused as I once was. I'm listening to, for example, the speed and the energy behind Train Running Low on Soul Call. I, where did that all go? <laughs> I wish I still had it. Uh, so I really, really had to struggle to uh, to get it back into my brain and and muscle memory and all the rest of it. I mean, there was things like Melt the Guns uh, from from English Settlement, all the English Settlement stuff that I did on that twelve string Rickenbacker. Uh, it, it, hard, hard work, man. It was hard work. It's tough on the and, hands, yeah. Uh, yeah. Whereas at the time. I just did it, you know, I just hadn't really sweated at all. But then again, you know, what was I was still in my 20s, I think, you know, I was probably approaching 30. And um, there's a big difference now, you know, so after all this time, you lose stuff. But it also speaks to the sophistication of the guitar writing. I mean, there, there's there's an ethos built in from the beginning that, well, certainly after Barry, that you know this is all going to fit together like a puzzle. Mm. And when yeah. I'm not playing, you'll be playing. And when we're playing together, it's going to interlock this way. And it became for many of us a, a study, really, on you know two guitars, bass, and drums. How does one make that fit together in different ways that are interesting? And of course, the fretless bass. There's a lot of really sort of quirky choices that are made along the way. Um, and I guess that's what we all love about XTC is, is that that variety and that attitude of, no, you can't really pin us down. But also check this out. This is going to be some really intricate little stuff in here. And you'll listen to it again and you'll say, oh, I didn't hear that before. I didn't think hmm. it, I didn't realize that was connected to this thing. And again, the puzzle. Um, 
it's it's really kind of a it's just a fun game to be in. The reason it was fun, one of the reasons it was fun was that we didn't overthink it. Mm. Never ever did Andy and I sit down face to face. What are you playing? What am I playing? We never sort of said, does this work? Is this going to, we just were on opposite sides of the room, drums in the middle and Colin in the middle. And we just played until it clicked. We just found it. If I'd known at the time that these parts were going to be, uh, you know, analysed and listened to in fine detail, uh, I would have probably, you know, struggled. I would have had to go home, like I do now, you know, I kind of, before I do anything at all, I sit and write out what I'm going to play. I can't trust that uh, I'm going to be able to improvise my way out, out of any situation. I have to know what I'm going to do before I even pick the guitar up. I, want, I need to know now where my fingers are going to be going. And um, it's it's uh, because I'm thinking too much about the outcome. Uh, sometimes that's beneficial. Other times, you know, it kind of destroys the spontaneity. But then again, I'm thinking, well, it's, Spontaneity in my case probably isn't such a good thing because I'm just going to make mistakes and ruin the show for everybody else. So it's best for everybody that I do overthink things and write the bloody things down and practice. So that's that's kind of where I am now. Um, yeah, but but you know we didn't care in those. I didn't mean, think anyone was going to be listening to us five years on. You know it's just we're just making a record. Did it get in the charts? No. Did it make us a lot of money? No. Okay. Are we going to make another one? Well, we'll have to see if the record company will let us. We had no expectations at all, other than um, hoping we'd have the, have the budget to do another album and that Andy and Colin would come up with the songs, which so they always we, did. But that leads me to the question of what was the group morale like during Big Express? What was the vibe? It was good. It was actually good, despite the fact that uh, I think we kind of got over the fact that we'd lost Terry and we weren't going to be touring. <clears throat> um, we we were, It was good because we'd found a studio that was local to us, uh, that we could drive to and from every day from home. We didn't have to leave home. Uh, it wasn't going to cost us a fortune like the studios in London. It's about I don't know, two thirds the, the price, the recording cost. Of course, that all went because we spent more, way too much time in the studio on this record, uh, to the point where David Lord had to leave because he ran out of time, had other, other stuff, other stuff booked elsewhere. So we lost him, you know, kind of after three months or so. Three months is plenty of time to make a decent record. So what's happening then? What's eating up time? Ah, uh, well, have you worked with Andy before? Have you ever, uh, you know, met anyone who's uh, quite as meticulous? And Well, there were a couple of, no, to be fair, record company couldn't hear the single. So it was a case, case of, uh, well, you know, we, we, we need you to work with such and such a mix engineer and so and so and so forth. Um, uh, and we need to employ um, some someone who can we can create a hit single, hopefully, and uh, and and get this thing off the ground because you know we've it's time we took you guys to the bank, and um, so far you're just wasting money. So there was that. You know we had to be we had to stay there until the job was acceptable to the record company. We we kind of hadn't identified the business model of record companies in those days. Bearing in mind the bands were kept on such a minimal royalty, all to be paid back, you know, sorry, the, the, the advances that they were provided with all had to be paid back from these tiny royalties that would take forever and ever to recoup. Meanwhile, the record companies, you know, taking the lion's share of the profit, once they've recouped their costs, it's all cash in the bank for them. So the longer they can keep the band in debt, uh, the longer it is before they have to start paying royalty. Yeah. We didn't, we weren't aware, you know, no one had explained that to us at that time. We just used to look at the, uh, 
you know, we look at the, when we didn't actually receive royalty statements, that all went to the management, management. But we just couldn't understand why we were still in debt after after so much time and uh, yeah, yeah. So there was there was a, probably uh, the idea of the record company spending, making sure we spent enough money to keep ourselves in debt for as long as possible, so that you know they wouldn't be forced to shell out royalty any any sooner than they absolutely had to under the terms of the contract. So I suppose it's amazing that we recouped at all under those circumstances. I guess I, an average fan might be surprised that things like Nigel and Senses didn't really make uh, a big difference for you guys financially. But well, they did. It's just we weren't aware of it. We were not... Uh, I'm, I, see, I... I, this is a different subject, Greg. I, I, I don't really want to get too deeply into it. Yes, but yeah. the fact that we um, we we weren't actually we weren't seeing any royalty statements. They were all being sent to uh, this manager that we had, and uh, we despite repeated requests to have a meeting about the accounts and uh, how we were fixed. We, we we you know he just kind of made himself scarce. Uh, we couldn't, uh, we, we, we were just unable to. So we'd go to the record company and say, well, look, where are we? What, what, oh, well, don't worry. We'll, we'll, don't worry. We'll always supply you. We'll always pay your recording costs. We'll always give you a recording budget. We'll have that money. Well, we'd always see that. So the money would come in and then we'd take a portion of it to live on. That would go into a separate account for us to pay ourselves a monthly wage. Um, but anything ab above that, once the advance was, was used up, there wasn't anything else. Um, it all it all came to light about five, six years later, um, how much had gone missing and all the rest of it. It's really, really, it's no different from any other band's tale of woe concerning management and record companies. The record companies every bit as much to blame as the management band always suffers they do all the work they provide the material they provide all the uh, work fans buy the music they love the music they buy the records all the money goes elsewhere to other into other pockets so um while whilst i fully appreciate the fact that without the record companies um distribution service and and publicity you wouldn't sell anything at all you know no one would know who you were from adam uh, at the same time they have a duty of care under the terms of the contract that they made us sign it's the thing people forget yeah you signed the contract that's always the, the that's always the big get out for these people yeah well you signed the contract and you just think yeah so did you you thieving so that that was kind of there was that and we had to deal with it and we didn't deal with it and it went on and on and on until we were forced to deal with it so uh, anyway that's uh, that's the happy story of xdc's well, success and certainly a few songs uh came out of that situation i wanted to yeah i wouldn't be able to sing about something like that because it upsets me um but Andy had no problem at all. Well, the, you know, it, it's, again, this palpable emotional edginess that's in a lot of his vocal performances, but there's a um, urgency too. Um, and that inhabits all the songs on this record. You know, um, so again, I'm mystified by people that would dismiss the Big Express. And at the same time, I'm thinking... This is still the meaty part of the curve, and and the songwriting is just sublime, and and everything that's happening is is there for us to to discover, um, and and even more so now with the new the new mixes, etc. Um, what did you think? Were you discovering anything listening to this that you noticed maybe in the demos or things that really uh, struck you going back in? I was just reminded about how 
brilliant uh, the writing was really because um struggling myself with my own music and trying to get songs finished even without recourse to, to lyrics i haven't written a lyric ever i wouldn't know where to start because i don't have anything to say so we have to sort of look and say well this is a guy who really really has a point of view and a brilliant way of expressing himself and that was never really but i never fully gave Andy the credit he deserved at the time because we were all sort of struggling and trying to make an you know mark our own leave our own imprint on on the record and do whatever we could to to make a name for ourselves as individuals when really without those songs that that opportunity that platform wouldn't be available so I'm, I have renewed respect for him as an artist and as a writer and um and also as a guitar player as well because uh, he does have his own style and uh, and i can't really i you know i i i went to listen to the uh you, you may may not be aware of this um um of the uh, atmos uh system that uh, they had a playback session in london back in march i think it was I was invited to because nobody else wanted to go oh, really? where you, you know, sat in the dark, surrounded by 18 loudspeakers playing this style. And uh, so I thought, yeah, well, that sounds like fun. I'd love I only have one opportunity to hear this record like that. And that really did um, introduce a whole, you know, I could hear exactly how much detail there was in the songs. Again, I hadn't heard it for such a long time. So it was really, really refreshing. and lovely to hear it in such sum sumptuous surroundings and just the general feeling that uh, it really was a professional very up to the minute recording full of really really well just good just proper proper music really creative music made by a bunch of young guys who you know probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to do it at, uh, at all coming from where we did that's the other thing you know people were always kind of sidelining us because we weren't from london we weren't even from manchester or liverpool or anything we were in this little town in the west country um and it's just kind of like this little backwater i get but people it's sort of like like a national joke almost swindon or it has been it's not really plenty of worse places to live i can promise you but um, that, that's the general, you know, the, the, we, we were kind of sidelined for that reason, I think, as much as anything else. Because when we're interviewed, we do sound a little bit bumpkin -y, you know, we sound a bit, a bit like farmer's boys. Um, well, but then again, but you know, you, I, I, I've taken crap my whole life for being from New Jersey. So, huh. I, you know, I can relate and there's no good reason for it because... No. If, unless you've really been there, you don't really know what's going on. You just sort of have this exactly. stereotype fitting. But I do know that XDC not being in those other places is what makes XDC become XDC. Wow. Yeah, I mean, we're actually quite proud of coming from Swindon and, do, and achieving what we've done. And just because, because uh, yes, there have, have been individual musicians from the town who've gone on to, to bigger and better things, but I think there has been a group that has um, achieved quite as much. And I think that with the passage of time, I know that we're still attracting new fans who, who weren't born when the records were made. So that's very encouraging to think that um, there was nothing fashionable about what we did. We weren't riding on anybody's um, trendy coattails. We were doing our own thing and making, you know, just making our own music in our own way. And um, yeah, it was never going to be to anybody, everybody's taste. Right. But, we didn't, but that kind of is what, what made it special because we knew what we were doing and uh, we enjoyed what we were doing and uh, we didn't like that's the other thing didn't like much of the music that was around at the same time made by people our age it's way too much synth synthesizer stuff and dance music and party music and all this kind of not and, and, and 
you know, guys dressed up like clowns. And you just think, you, I don't want to be in in their party. So that that was that was that was kind of, you know, we saw ourselves probably more as um, I don't know, maybe ser more serious, perhaps more progressive musicians rather than pop stars, whereas the record company thought we still had potential as pop musicians. Well, and as someone when, who alive at that time, just coming out of college, we're talking about, you know, or 83, 84. Yeah, the playing field was horrendous. Yeah. I, I had moved over to jazz by that point. There was no point in me listening to, you know, what you described in terms of the drum sounds and the keyboard sounds and the lack of writing and people dressing up like it was a carnival. Uh, I remember it well, and it didn't interest me then. Um, and you can see now how XTC holds up because you were a part, a part of it, away yeah. from you were you were your own thing. And this is again what's inspiring to so many of us about the band. It's just that there's this we're doing our thing, and that's what we do. And yes, there will be very catchy, likable little ditties and things, but there's going to be some meat on there. Mm -hmm. Dave, I was really curious about kind of the aftermath of the record and, you know, the fact that there were videos made for uh, Pretty Girls and This World Over, which for some reason aren't included in the package. But, you know, there seems to have been some push here to make something happen. Uh, do you remember the video sessions? Uh, the only video we made was for um, <clears throat> All You Pretty Girls. Don't recall that one. One being for for this world over. Maybe I can't remember it though. Unless you know better, maybe you could well, jog my memory. Just, it's just Andy, I think maybe. Uh, well, um, yeah, no, we. It was a big budget production, two day shoot mm -hmm. with a cast of thousands, as I mentioned in my liner notes. And um, yeah, I remember the second day was uh, the first. The first day was out in the open in the, in the Docklands area of, of East London before it was all built up. It was right at the point where they were destroying the old warehouses and erecting these new buildings. Um, and uh, oh, we had this uh, dozens of people all in costume dress and everything. It's and kind of <laughs> we thought, yeah, well, this is uh, this this is going to be something. I think actually, I think it was quite a good quite a good video for us That's again fun. you see it cost it cost thousands of pounds and we thought well, what this is uh, why is the record company doing this so of course years later you realize why they spent all that money so i've just described so um the second day we were in a theater um in stratford uh the, the old uh, it's, a, it's it's east london famous theater still still in existence still in use and um i remember we were still shooting at uh, three in the morning and i was absolutely exhausted i know i might you know i had i was having problems with my diabetes at the time i just remember I, i've seen some shots from like the small hours of the second day of us sort of sitting in a pretend boat trying trying to look happy singing this song and i'm looking like death on Meals and feeling like it, you know, and I, so it was. It was a pretty. <laughs> I don't have very good memories of the whole thing, but I, you know, the finished video was actually not bad. It, it, but it, was it XTC really? I mean, was it really the sort of thing we wanted to do? It sort of was on par with what we just talked about in a lot of the uh, the bands that were putting up. Well, you had to have something on MTV at that time. That's right. That was it. That was that was the whole ethos. Make sure it gets it gets rotated. <laughs> um, but what a cool tune! Let's talk about that for a second. Yes, you know, I thought it was fun. brilliant. I thought it was a great song. Yeah, um, really, really good. Uh, I don't uh, I don't think I played guitar on it. I did a lot of uh, keyboard stuff. I did a fake sort of. Uh, um, it's it was like a, a hornpipe melody towards the end and um and some profit stuff all it was all done on the profit synth 
You mean like the it's sort of um, the the um, pan pipes, not pan pipes, yeah, sort of like a flutish kind of melody at the ride out, yeah. That's and then there's that descant vocal melody that goes over on the ride out too. Yeah, right. That's very strange. It's good, yeah, but you know, it was fun. I just, I uh, yeah, we, I thought, fine. This is a, this is a really happy record. What a, what a happy sounding thing, and a nice little, nice little message. And um, well, I guess it was out of step with what people wanted to hear at the time. So what's the? That's the first single. Yeah, I think it was. And what's no the wake up. Wake Up was the first single, I think. No, no, wait a minute, was it? I can't remember, Greg. Uh, it's, it's, well, there were three singles. Wake yeah. Up, All New Pretty Girls, and This World Over. And I thought that This World Over was probably uh, the one that stood the better chance. Yeah. I did some television, actually. Uh, went on a thing called... Um, swap shop uh, it was a saturday morning kids show in, in on the bbc uh that was let me see january of 1985 and we were on there with bands like um <clears throat> altered images and uh I'm trying to think who else was there but it was it, it, it was a pop show. it was a kids pop show and we, we were doing this <laughs> doom laden song uh we brought stuart gordon up to play violin and sit at the piano. Uh, and, um, and Andy was, you know, coaxed out of uh, his hermitage in order to sit in front of a camera and pretend to be singing. Uh, but it didn't do anything, you know, it didn't, uh, didn't take off at all. It was a big disappointment. You sang This World Over on a kid's show? Yeah. All right. Let's, oh yes, we should, we should Saturday morning kids show. Okay, I'm just trying to wrap my head around that for a minute, but it's some, something very darkly British about that. I don't know. <laughs> well, as I say, altered images took up the slack. They were one of those cheerful party bands. They were they they did the job, you know. They were, I think I think I remember about that was. <laughs> Poor Claire Grogan, she's just a tiny little thing. Bass player swung around with his P bass and clonked her on the head. <laughs> and she went, oh dear, so they, that was a retake. But uh, anyway, that was, was kind of, they were the fun act. We were the, we were the doom laden, always. Mm -hmm. What we have to talk a little bit about, please, uh, the, the B sides. Red Brick Dream, uh, Blue Overall, and uh, what am I leaving out? Uh, yeah, Red Brick Dream, Blue oh, Overall. Oh, Wash Away, Wash Away, Wash Away. Oh, Wash Away, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Wash Away was one of Colin's uh, lighter moments. It was a fun th thing to work on, yeah. I mean, it was. I, I've, I've met people who think it's their favorite song on the record. And so um, you can't argue with that. And but uh, yeah, it was kind of done in a kind of um, Chas and Davy type of style with a honky tonk piano. And uh, it was the one song I think that was missing off. We we took a day out at at a different studio without a, a proper in tune grand piano because the piano at Crescent Studios was a little. It was a good quality piano, but it wasn't. Uh, it kept going out of tune. Oh, it wouldn't hold its tuning for for, mm -hmm. for longer than a few a few sessions. But yeah, I can't. Really see. It was it was just a, a little jokey. I don't, I'm not sure how. Um, you'd have to ask Colin about it. Just a song about life as it used to be in in Merry England years and years ago. Blue overall, we did at the mixing session for. Well, we did it at Rack. Uh, I think there was, uh, I think that's, did Pete Phipps play on it? He might have done, I think there's some Lindrum on it, heavily processed. Right. And I played some blues guitar, slide guitar. Um, but they, you know, Andy wasn't sure what he wanted to do with it. So it was a question of, um, well, let's just make this as 
really bluesy and dirty and miserable sounding as we can. So what better than sort of my amateurish slide playing? I got better at slides since then, I have to say. Mm. But uh, back then it was very much just a, a sound effect. Uh, but there was, um, I, I thought it was a howl of pain. <laughs> uh, again, the play out, very, very agonizing. Right. But that was done as, as it was finished off at, uh, at Rack Studios with Phil Thorne Alley, and, uh, and then he mixed it that evening, I think. And um, then the other one you mentioned was uh, uh, Oh, Red Brick Dream. Yeah. Is that That's the same all, that is, hard tuning? Well, Andy did that all by himself. I imagine it probably was. The only, uh, the only extra musician on it is um, that we had a visitor at the studio, a lad, American guy came, it came, he just knocked on the door. He'd heard we were in there. I don't remember what his name was, I'm sorry. But he, he showed up and Andy thought, oh, why don't I uh, treat this lad to a bit of fun? And he said, uh, take this microphone, and just um, make this droning sound. Okay, you've got to, you know, just make a oing, oing, oing. Do this, do this into the microphone, and we'll make a loop of it, and we'll put some treatment on it, and then you can tell all your friends you're on the record. So this guy was petrified. I remember him sitting there and he said, "This is like the Pope meeting Jesus Christ." So he said, "Okay, Popey, off you go." So there was him and this lad. Just and Andy did it all by himself using this. Uh, yeah, this is an odd sounding. Can't remember what the guitar was. It sounds acoustic. It sounds like a steel strung, probably the, the Martin D35, with a whole bunch of stuff thrown over it. And um, <clears throat> that's how it turned out. That's actually a nice song. It is a good song. And it's got a mysterious quality to it that uh, would probably have been lost had the band sort of got to grips with it and stomped all over it. Well, you know, knowing when not to play is is such an interesting part of arranging, mm -hmm. isn't it? When not to have everything and how you best present a musical idea in the proper environment, right? Yes, which reminds me of a hilarious quote from Robert Fripp. When asked why Bill Bruford was credited on the song Trio, along with the three other guys, he said, Bill's decision to not play on Trio formed the major part of the composition of that song. Or words to that effect. Yeah. Admirable restraint was his credit. Yes. <laughs> well, look, you know, Drummers have to know when to lay out. <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah. Drummers are particularly guilty. I've been I've been I don't know about that. Over. I've been trying to leave more space. It's so so difficult that I find myself overplaying time after time. I I always tell myself before I start, just let the just let the singer do what he has to do and shut up. And then when there's nothing happening, maybe you can find something to play in there and do something useful but um you know if that song it's it's the singer and the lyric really that's the that is what the song is everything else is decoration so stum. Yeah. Um, yes and how good am i at, at sticking to that ethos not very i try but it's so tempting, isn't it? Especially when you've got a sound you're in love with. I don't know, I'm tie, you know, I'll just sort of find it. Oh, I love this tone. I'm going to use this. Oh, what, can I, what else can I do with this tone? Right. I know. I'll obliterate the vocal with it. Right. So w when Big Express is a, become sort of a uh, a non-starter in terms of getting you guys which I also think was unfair to to for to judge a band based upon hit singles, but then then all of a sudden they're they're giving you ultimatums to to make skylarking a certain way. Is that right? Yeah. Um, well, they sort of. But actually, you know, to be fair to uh, Virgin people in London, they never 
interfered with us and when we when we were working they didn't send a and our guys down to the studio to push us around and make suggestions and suggest who we should be working with and what songwriters we should be collaborating with they never they they kept away until the record was mixed and then maybe a couple of guys from the a and r department would come down and then our friend al clark who, who was the pr uh, the guy who was our friend and in our corner at all times he he drop in from time to time he, he never criticized it well, occasionally he would but not in a serious way he wouldn't issue any instructions so to be to their credit they let us do what we did and uh, they would often say you know once the album was delivered then you'd start getting things like oh well we think we're not sure about this and um can we take this off this side too it's too much music that's the other thing english settlement the a and r guy said well there's too much music on this <laughs> very much there's a vote of confidence for you and that's why you know the american version was chopped chopped and uh, into pieces so um yeah it, but they they didn't really interfere until skylarking when andy started um moaning and groaning about todd's production and and and, and, the, and the difficulties that uh, personal personality or issues he'd had with todd vice versa but i thought it was the, um, the hiring up of todd that was coming from virgin yes it was yes no no that was fine no i'm talking about when the record was delivered yeah. and they said um <clears throat> we that you know We've got to this. We can't get all this music on. One of these songs has to go. We can't put it. So dear. So Andy said, "Well, I, I'm not too happy with what Dear God is has done. I mean, it's just a, a tiny pebble in the ocean of um, religious beliefs. I, I can't do the subject justice in a three minute song. So let's 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 take that off, and we'll put another satellite on instead. And that was that was the issue he had that Todd had with Andy." He didn't see another satellite as being part of the, um, mm -hmm. of the, it was outside the circle, as he put it. So Andy wasn't having that, and so there was that issue. Um, and then, of course, everything uh, turned around when somebody, a radio station in LA, picked up on it and started playing it, and every, suddenly everyone wanted to know. So the record company was very embarrassing. Uh, recalled the album and um, repressed it with Dear God. And then sadly, you know, we lost Mermaid Smiled. Probably one of my favourite songs of all of our song, all of the XTC catalogue. It's such a beautiful little piece of music. I say that because I'm not even on it, other than just playing a uh, uh, vibraphone line that's already written. Which is a chord vibraphone it was something yeah it was something in uh, todd had it sampled into his fair light what i did was play the keys and it and that's that was that's my involvement i didn't write it i just loved the way um you know that sort of lovely samba groove and the sound of the acoustic guitar and the fretless bass which it wasn't a fretless bass tell a lie it was uh, an old epiphone newport bass that colin had that sounded exactly like a string bass um right that, that all that was needed and then you had mingos uh conga, congas and so on is that the base so that's on um farm boys wages i imagine it probably is yes yeah. because i think he well yeah he, when we when we did the big express uh there were some there was always there were always issues with colin the tuning of colin's bass because the epiphone is a medium scale bass and it was a bit like a hofner violin bass in terms of you know scale length and sound and there were tuning issues and eq issues i know it used to drive Hugh pageant mad so david lord suggested he had a friend in bath who had a wow bass and he suggested he could borrow this bass if Colin was prepared to use it because he knew he could record it and it would sound good. Uh, sure enough, it did. And the bass guy brought the bass round. Colin tried it and fell in love with it and wanted to buy it. Well, of course, um, Guy wasn't interested in selling it at all. But somehow, Colin must have offered him 
you know, a big wedge of money uh, because he was able to uh, to buy the bass from this this fellow, this friend of David's. I, I forget his name. I can't remember his name. I'm sorry. That's how Colin came by the Wow bass, and that was the sound, the bass sound of Big Express, which is a, a very much better, much improved tone. I think you know. I think it. Uh, this what was it? I was listening to earlier that I hadn't noticed before. Colin's uh, Colin's playing on on uh, You're the Wish. Some really really fine bass playing on that, but it's you know it's a uh, period. Um, on the other hand, I remember the vinyl pressing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, that came out last year where pretty much all you can hear on seagull screaming is the bass it's just so oh, too much but it's good good playing and sounds good yeah so that was a turning point that was one one thing and then and as far as i know colin still has the bass he he loves it the other issue with it is that it relied on a battery for the active circuit and the battery was never <laughs> You know, we would always have to send away, wait while the batteries were shopped for, you know. This is why I will never ever own a guitar with an active circuit. It just they're just so unreliable and and um you know, you if you can't do it with a simple pickup and six strings, get another hobby. Because there's yeah. plenty of processing gear out there, you can pedal and god knows what will do the job just as well. As a drummer, I have very vivid memories of waiting for people to get batteries together and it was even worse big big train when they started using in-ear monitors and the damn things all everyone had their own little transmitter pack and you'd get halfway through a rehearsal so and suddenly someone's hand would go up oh, i can't hear a fucking thing so the, you know and then the batteries were here you know, session would stop batteries would be handed out and you just think oh for god's sake get yourself a wedge <laughs> <laughs> anyway there was that yeah so i kept i i did i tried with the in ears but i didn't like them uh, i couldn't get a feel for the guitar at all you know i really because i think with guitar players as i imagine with drummers as well you need to feel the air moving around you just to just to add that extra you know if you're just hearing a little bit of fizz in your ear also that's not going to be very inspiring i've done it but, in necessity large hmm. stage setups where you're never going to really hear people uh you're not going to feel them anyway because they're so far away out of necessity you would go in here just for clarity but yeah you want to feel the vibration of when you're hitting things and your ears not accepting it it's accepting it through a third party or something you know well because you want to hear what everyone else is doing as well and feel the air moving what they what they're creating um just feeling like you're part of this uh, of the big machine rather than just an isolated cog somewhere in the, mm. in the machinery uh i yeah I've I've found that the in-ear is very useful for monitoring in here sometimes if I want to. But you see, my ears now, I've got maybe this year 40, 50 percent hearing loss. So I never hear true stereo. I can only, uh, you know, it's just like I've got a job to hear my alarm radio in the morning if I'm flying on the wrong ear. So uh, it, that's, there you go, another age issue. Do you hear from Pete Phipps? What's he up to? Yeah, Pete, I invited along to this uh, to that to that surround sound uh, thing that we that we we had in March, and I hadn't seen him for over thirty years. Uh -huh. It was great to catch up with him, and uh, he's still well, he was out of action for a few years because he had hip replacement, and he's um, but he's still playing. Uh, he's a lovely fella. I, I, he hadn't changed a bit in his personality. He's twice the size that he was when I last saw him. But uh, no, very, very nice man. Brilliant drummer. Actually, I think if you listen, there's a, there's a bonus track on the Big Express thing that never got finished, The Troubles. And you can hear Pete playing this little military snare drum thing for about three or four minutes without stopping. It's beautiful. And, I would, and we never actually finished... Didn't, never did anything with the track other than guitars. And he was ready to 
some vocals on. This was uh, this was just not long written the song. Uh, it dealt with the political situation in Northern Ireland, and I think people were a little bit, you know, shy of going in that direction at that time because it was a very sensitive issue. And so um, it got sidelined. But <laughs> thankfully, there's this beautiful basic track with Pete's drums, and um, you, I think you'll appreciate it if you listen. Well, there's the feeling, no, but he um, he's busy doing. He got in touch with me a couple of years ago via Facebook. It was a because he was he said I'm doing this European um, 70s nostalgia trip. Uh, I'm playing drums with the reformed Roubettes. I don't know if the Roubettes did anything in the States. But they were very very big in the uh, 70s and early 80s over in this country. They kind of it was kind of a rock and roll revival thing, but not quite, because they, they were the new songs, you know, modern songs, but played with this sort of uh, retro style. And they were all dressed in drape coats and, and had uh, silly hats and so on. <laughs> I, I never really took to them that much, but they were very professional and they were good singers as well. So Pete said, we're looking for a guitarist. Would you be interested? It would be guitars and vocals. Oh, so no, I remember who bets. Um, their vocals are far too refined and polished. I would never, no, I would fail the audition on our vocals without hesitation. Thanks for the offer, Pete, but I can't do it. Oh. So I would have done, had it not been for that, I probably would have just for, just for the experience of doing it and having, and just getting out on stage again. Because I haven't done anything live significantly since, uh, since Big Big Train. So uh, it would have been something to, it would, have been, it would have been a fun trip. But then I, I met him when I asked Pete how that tour went. He said, uh, oh, well, it was all right. It was fun. He says, but we're still waiting to be paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just say yep. lovely. You know, it's just uh, just how it is. Some things never change. No. Well, Dave, what what a pleasure to speak with you about this stuff in detail. And your recall, as always, is is pretty amazing. Well, it's not what it was. I, I regret to say. I wish I could remember more of what happened. But, but like I say, we were in a good place ourselves. Into as as a you know as a band, we were still. This was knew we had a, a reasonable album in the works, uh, and uh, and we were just grateful for the opportunity of having some money with which to record the thing and and get it uh, get it organized and released but it, it it just it's just rather a long a long process that's the one i do highly recommend everyone who has or has not heard big express to find this box set with blu-ray and uh and rediscover a, a gem of songwriting and and pop rock music whatever you want to call it it's a mm. wide swath as usual from xdc it's difficult to define what it is isn't it i Creative suppose we were just writing uh, yeah yeah no i don't i don't know if i would if i would care to even say it's pop music mm. that's why i always mm. think i like the title of the uh documentary ironically being this is pop because I don't, yeah i don't know that that i because i told this to andy uh in in my talks with him and i i i'm happy to say it again to you dave which is there's something about xtc music that's very subversive mm -hmm. you subvert ex expectation but you also s subvert stereotypes and and the image of of it being just a pop band yeah 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 and i think that's one of the things that we like about you guys well i can remember a quote from todd rundgren about you know andy as, as a writer he said you have you you have you entranced with these beautiful melodies and key changes and chords these bizarre chords and you'll just be getting into a a state of emotional bliss suddenly bash, you put the knife in and uh and destroy the entire effect 
but you know that's what he does you know it's like this resentment of authority and expectation you know that's that's only for you don't just expect the unexpected yeah no i think you've hit upon it it's definitely this uh failure of of uh not failure but just the complete negation of we're going to go along with whatever you think this is i never really i guess the idea of not feeling fully grounded is something that i enjoy like i enjoy horror movies i enjoy suspense i enjoy being surprised and that's what's going on all the time in these songs unless you know you but then again you look at something like um uh this world over which is just it's like a vibe so yeah. the ability to to have that um pal that palette of settling in versus unsettled mm, yeah but what do you think are the are the musical models in this situation at this point in in your career in in, eight, in the mid 80s are you just really cast adrift or are you you know because because i know that there's that long running fascination with psychedelia the psychedelic you know psych rock stuff mm -hmm. and you're coming up on going to be doing uh the the um stratosphere dukes yeah so you know are you are you dealing with like what's going on that you're enjoying around this time is are there any things that are inspiring xtc around this time that you say yeah that, i'll have some of that well i i think um I can't I can't speak for Andy. He was much more adventurous in his listening habits than I was. So I can't really remember what it was, you know, because he's still um he's still a huge fan of uh, well, Captain Beefheart and the, and and the Ramones even and uh, there weren't many of the current crop of new bands or even some of you because know, he never really um he never really was into rock music or rhythm or rhythm and well, I suppose he was he loved uh, certain certain songwriters he's always been a big fan of um Judy Sill yes. and uh that was that was one of the things he turned me on to her music very very early on so that was the romantic side I suppose of Andy's uh, his um that probably represented his softer side but I can't tell you what he what he listened to or where he got his ideas from, because I think he probably, as soon as anyone spotted a similarity to something else, he 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 throw it away. You know, he'd drop it, drop it in an instant if it reminded anybody of of anybody else's music, unless it was something that he was deliberately parodying, i.e., the Dukes. For me, I be I was listening to what saved the eighties for me were bands like um, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Todd, Todd Rundgren, definitely because I only really um, rediscovered him in the late seventies by chance when Hermit of Mink Hollow came out, and having heard that, I had to go right the way back, album by album, to right back to the Nas days, and that fascinated me for pretty much all of the eighties. Hmm. Just listening to his way of working with melody and harmony and that amazing voice which has never really uh, got the full credit that it so deserves i know that he's finally been inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame which uh, well you know it's a nice gesture i suppose but that should have happened years and years ago but there was also um, bands like uh, people like sting for example you know emerging from a super successful group like the police to carve this amazing solo career. If you think about him, he's a really, really good writer and a great musician. And he knows the people to, choose, uh, to, to, to perform with. He's made some great albums. I think he uh, is quite an uh, uh, inspiration on Colin. I think, uh, you know, everything from Colin's decision to buy a fretless bass through to just you know writing the, the hit songs yeah colin always sort of fancied himself as the, the hit song writer rather than the the artist so um i'm just trying to think who else was uh, being uh, well frank zappa of course yeah that would always his music right throughout the 80s 
always fascinating, always interesting. And I, I, I just grabbed everything he put out. And there was a lot of it, actually, wasn't there? Frank just kept it coming. Um, and always with the most amazing musicians, because it was all recorded live. And this is the other extraordinary thing. When, when Mike Keneally got in touch, Mike and Scott got in touch with us in 1988, was it early months of 88? Mm -hmm. Called, got in touch with Andy and uh, he called me and said, have you heard of these guys, Scott Tunis? And uh, I said, oh, Scott Tunis is Frank Zappa's bass player. What? He's not spoken to you. Well, no, I haven't spoken to him, but Mike Keneally, have you heard of him? I said, no, no. Well, apparently he's, the new stunt guitarist in Frank Zappa's band, and uh, they want to meet us. I said, what have we done wrong? <laughs> what do you mean they want to meet us? They don't want to meet us. Well, they do, and they've invited us up to a show in Birmingham. Do you, do you fancy going? I said, yeah. And that's how we met um, Mike and Scott, and they turned out to be these huge fans. Um, and have been friends ever since. And, uh, and you just thought, well, maybe we do mean something to, uh, to, to, to serious musicians. You know, we, we didn't really see us, we, we knew what our limitations were as players. Uh, we never expected any kudos from, you know, the top draw of uh, musical, of, of players, certainly not international. People of international renown, like Frank Zappa's musicians. Um, but there you are. That, that was that was a big moment for me in thinking, "Wow, we better uh, <laughs> we better start, start taking this seriously." I think Skylarking did us a lot of favors. You know, working with Todd Rundgren, suddenly people were thinking, "What are these guys? What, who are these guys working with Todd now?" They must have something if he's prepared to work with these fellas. And uh, so um, that the Skylarking album, yeah, did us a huge favor in the States. It's and, funny. Um, we, we also really all, Keneally and you and I and, and uh, so many musicians have always have the Todd thing. The Todd thing is in there. You know, you just say uh -huh. Todd is part of it. You know, I've been playing uh, on and off with him for over 10 years now uh, when whenever Prairie's not available. And um, it's just sort of like a baseline foundational thing. You you must yeah. have an understanding and respect for Todd Rundgren and his contribution to creative music, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like... Yes, there must be at least a, a minimum of uh, four degrees of separation between you and Todd. Yes. So if there's an indirect contact, well, that's an even smaller group. But yeah, yeah. And Keneally, uh, someone that I've known since 2000 and 2001, maybe, and uh, have a, a new track coming out on his next record, the two of us co-wrote. And he's yeah. such, a, such a pleasure. And, and we kind of both turn multi-instrumental. So I'm doing xylophone vibraphone drum set all the percussion he's doing everything else right oh and i look forward to hearing that yeah it turned out real nice really yeah. happy with it cool now i saw him recently i saw him back in march he came over with devon townsend they did a gig in bristol and uh, invited me down and it was uh i thought well this is, this is a heavy rock gig i know i'm not sure about the I'm take, going to take away from this, but I'm curious. And, and, it, and it was great to meet Mike again. But it was a great show. I was so impressed. I thought, wow, because Devin must be in his early 50s now. But he had so much energy and uh, really, really good contact with the audience. And just the pace of the set, the way everything was calculated down to the last half measure. It was between song banter. But everyone knew when the band had stopped, they started playing. You know, yeah. I was really impressed with how tight it all was. Yeah. And so um, it was a great evening and it was great to catch up with Mike and just, yeah, banter along, you know. Yeah, no, it's very, very nice, man. I'm super, super talented. And all, I'm glad to see always busy. As busy as he wants to be. I guess, yeah, which is probably all the time. Yeah. 
yeah, very, and just always new music, always stuff to do. So I'm hoping we're going to get to do some more live stuff in the coming year. But yeah, cool. Yeah, I saw I saw the Devin Townsend show when it came around with uh, Dream Theater and Animals as Leaders. And uh -huh. oh my god, that was a lot of uh, guitar. <laughs> it sure is. You know Animals as Leaders? I do. I've got a couple of their albums. I mean, it's exhausting just listening to it, you know. And I just wonder, God damn, where did that? Where does it come from? Where does all that skill come from? Amazing player. You know what's funny about um, about this too uh, is that the same thing happened in classical music. So there's there's been this acceleration because I you know I work with a lot of young musicians and obviously we're following what some young players are doing. Tosin Abbasi is a great example of just where they stood on the shoulders of guys like Vi and, you know, Adrian and, and these guys who were doing extended guitar technique essentially is what it is. Right. Yeah. And it's happened in, in classical music as well, which I, you know, dip my toe into, which is that, you know, they're playing harder stuff now that, was unplayable in the 40s. In fact, those that you want to talk about Zappa, those Zappa scores that are generated by the Synclavier, they're playable now by college students. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of, uh, I, I, every day some, some guitar genius shows up on YouTube and, uh, you know, it's still in short trousers, some of them. And you yeah. just think, how how is that coming oh did you see the little eight-year-old chinese girl playing drums have you seen that one yes but but this is also that's for me that's more of a form of entertainment i'm talking about the people who are using the technique to create new material or that are a bit oh, yeah you see what i mean and sort of that's accelerated so the, the writing for instance on animals as leaders for me is substantial Whereas a lot of mm, sort of progressive metal things are foundations or platforms for people to shred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, is I get of, that. it's more integrated, I think, in in those situations, and uh, and three guys doing it. So there's that two eight strings. <laughs> yeah. By yeah. the time Dream Theater came on, I was I was full. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know. Oh god. No, no more guitar. No more picking. Yeah. I noticed that uh, Petrucci wasn't even among Rolling Stone's top 250 guitar players of all time. You mean there are actually 250 musicians on the planet who can play guitar better than John Petrucci? Apparently, yeah. Or Brian May. I don't think he's on the list, is he? Good Lord, man! I couldn't believe it. I haven't you seen the list. I've got, to, I've got to shut up because I'm just, I'm just quoting Rick Beato. He, he, he's studied the list and is horrified, and rightly so. I but, saw the, um, you know the top fifty Rolling Stone prog albums and didn't agree with that. So I mean, mm -hmm. you know, or the if that's how what like what are what's the judge? What are they judging things based upon? You know popularity it's sort of it gets back to the rock and roll hall of fame thing is it talent yes. originality or commerciality <laughs> you know is todd I'm on sorry. the list i hope todd's on the list doubt it i don't he might i think he might be he might be i'll have to see the. i, I mustn't say anymore because i haven't seen the list yeah, uh, okay Just go, i need to like I, you know i kind of don't want to see it so I'm, it, the problems arise, isn't, doesn't it, when when they start ranking things? It's one thing to put a list of play, great players. That's fine, but you shouldn't be ranking them. You don't know enough. No, well, who's ranking whom? Exactly, and who says when? Why? Why would you put so and so before somebody else? It's just not. And and again, it's like, how would you put? How do you compare Chet Atkins with John McLaughlin, for example? Who's the better player? Right. Who goes where? I, I, you know, I don't know. 
Pat Martin they're and both on Holdsworth. And Holdsworth isn't even on the list. Oh. I think that's what... Uh, I think that disqualifies the entire list. Perhaps it does, yes. I think he probably just... Uh, that, that omission tells the story. Oh, very much so. And then I'm sure, you know, Keith Richards is on it. So we're, we're all good. He certainly is. I think he's in the top 10. Chuck Berry's number two. Uh -huh. So let me guess then, because I don't know. Do you know who number one is? Well, I'll give you three guesses and a prize if you're wrong. Okay. Eddie Van Halen? No. Mm. Who do they think is the number one guitar player of all time? That's really the question. Who do they think? God, I don't even know. Um, well, it's the, it is actually the right answer. They got that one right, in oh. my opinion. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Older stylist? Yeah. It's foundational stylist? Unique stylist. Oh. But hugely influential. Oh, well, I'm blanking then. I, I should know this. Um, and you think it's worthy of number one? I do. Wow. Uh, I don't know. I give up. Well, he's a he's a black guy from music from from Seattle. Oh, Hendrix. Of course. Hendrix is number one. Okay, so that's not offensive. Oh. And there's some good in the top. Jeff Beck's in the top 10. But then so is Jimmy Page. Mm. And while Jimmy Page is hugely, hugely, hugely inspirational, he's a bit bloody clumsy. Jeff Beck. But uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, he's given me more, more joy. His music has provided so much joy to me. I'm not going to criticize Jimmy Page. He's because he is he is brilliant. He's made. I think they should they should release the criteria. That's they should do. Here's the top five criteria for these guys. Why we choose them? Popularity being number one. Yeah. Artistry being number five. <laughs> Originality being 5.5. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like is, is um, uh, Buckethead on the list? No. No. He was, uh, but Beato made mention of Buckethead and said, where was he? He should definitely be in there. And, um, yeah. Yeah. No, he is, he's extraordinary, isn't he? Gosh. Yeah. And, and if you know your, your stuff, you know, you know who the guitar players are. Um, I mean, to well, my my favorite player of all time wasn't listed, but then again, I wasn't surprised because you know, he didn't sell that many records. In fact, <laughs> he probably died in poverty. But uh, Ollie Halsall, to me, it's just he's as important to me as well Charlie Parker was to my dad's generation, and. Uh, it's, it's a shame that a lot of the stuff that was released officially on record wasn't necessarily his best work. He had to go see a gig and listen to bootleg tapes that people made at gigs to hear to hear him when inspiration struck. And it's just stunning. It just it just carries you away, you know, and it, with the, with a minimum of effort. And he, uh, I think, what kind of um, kind of reined him in a little bit was when he teamed up with Holdsworth in in Tempest the John Heisman outfit and the, the, suddenly he was he'd met his match and uh, you know there was supposed to be this sort of dialogue between these two amazing players but in fact it was like too too positive cre created a sort of negative effect somehow and I think Ollie might have thought uh, I can't I can't uh, I can't compete with that. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to be a songwriter. I'm going to write pop songs. <laughs> Wasn't he also came in Shadow? Yes. That's where he came from. And um, 
and then he joined, uh, then he formed this band Boxer with Mike Pato, Tony Newman, and then uh, he got, he did a, a bunch of work with Kevin Ayers, songwriter, oh. songwriter, and he did a lot of work in Europe. And I've heard some bootleg tapes from some of their gigs. And I'm, I'm not a particular fan of Kevin Ayers. Yeah. But it's worth sitting through a gig to, to hear what Ollie might, might be doing because it just suddenly, this sound will appear from somewhere that you weren't expecting and he's off. And uh, yeah, no, I just, I don't know how he did it. It's this, just this sort of, it's like some people are just conduits, aren't they, for some mystical force that comes through them, like Django Reinhardt, for example. How on earth, even with a full set of fingers, do you play some of the things that he did and the melodies that he came up with and this got across the strings and the bizarre chords with like two and a half fingers and a thumb. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be possible. And yet it is. And it's like I was saying about this the little eight year old Chinese kid who's playing drums at this. I was watching this on YouTube last week. Um, she's just playing along to a, you know, fairly bog standard kind of um fusion track and you'd think it was uh i don't know well billy cobham uh, it's just she she's just amazing there's no possible way she could have learned to play like that other than she just is connected to something or other that moves her arms and legs in a certain way in time to music in a very creative way you can explain it i, I can't because how do you teach someone like that for a start? You know, it's, uh, but anyway, yeah, it's for us to ponder. We've come some, uh, we've drifted slightly from the topic of conversation there, Greg. Sorry about that, but these things can happen. Not a problem, Dave. Always fun. Huh. So should we leave it there then? For today, That's the time. yeah, yeah, I could do with a, I'd do with a cup of tea, mate. Actually, I could do yeah. with a cup of tea. Yeah. I think I'll join you, everybody. Thank you so much. My guest has been Dave Gregory, one of our pals, one of our favorites, and uh, so happy to have this back in circulation and standing up on its own two legs and, and making a statement, XTC, the big express, everybody. Thank you for listening. This has been the broadcast. You can like us, subscribe, hit us up on Patreon. This is the only place you're going to get this kind of, kind of discussion and music. And Dave, I, I want to thank you again from the bottom of my heart. You're the best. Oh, thank you, Greg. It's been a pleasure to join you again. And um, thanks for, thanks for the, the kind words, basically, for, you know, the new disc. Oh, remixed by Stephen Wilson. We should add that because he has made a difference to it. And I uh, hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Uh, and speaking for as many of the fans that will allow me, I say, yes, yes, we do enjoy it. And we're very happy to have it. Thank you very much for buying it. <laughs> yes. See you next time, Dave. Always a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Cheers, Greg.